Christian, Chinese Academy of Sciences. He is also professor at School of Future Technology, University of Chinese Academy of Sciences, and a principal investigator at Center for Excellence in Brain Science and Intelligence Technology. All right, welcome. Thank you. Um, so it's a great honor to speak here. So uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, the invitation from Humanity Plus, especially from Wei, uh, who will meet in the, one of the program workshop. Uh, so my topic for today is, is, is really about um, brain-inspired artificial intelligence. So it's more uh, a scientific perspective. Uh, so I'm glad that we have uh, we have soon that talk about the uh, uh, industrial uh, evolution from uh, in, in China from the AI uh, engineering perspective. Uh, but what I would like to emphasize in here is that uh, the science of engineering of artificial intelligence is very different. So for example, we have this kind of backwards. Let's say for AlphaGo that after these kind of stories. So the scientific question that you may ask is something like this. The thing, so what does AlphaGo tells us about the nature of the intelligence? So how do the brain could coordinate various cognitive functions to realize the task and, and with the changing environment? Nothing. So how the theory of the brain and mind could inspire future AI? So in this case, this kind of efforts, what I would like to coin is is kind of database intelligence. It's kind of thing that, that like you have this data and you have a computational model to fit this kind of data and produce an output. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't coin this kind of efforts as as intelligence or real intelligence. So what we are striving for uh, in the scientific community, I, I would say should be mechanism based intelligence, which really answer these kind of questions. Um, so how do we do that? So there are hundreds of years of research for the brain. So if you search on PubMed or Science Direct, you will get like more than two million scientific papers about the brain. So the first thing that we do, that we do is to synthesize all the efforts together to provide the structured knowledge that answer problems and questions about the brain. And we see how many types of neurons we have in the brain, and how many microcircuits, and how many brain regions that function, and how they coordinate with each other to produce and to produce various different kind of cognitive functions. So this is the uh, brain-inspired way that we've been striving for. Is that we, we hope that the methodology should be inspired by the brain, but not completely the same as the brain. Uh, but from the behavior perspective, it should be uh, it should be with the human level at the starting point. Um, my understanding about uh, intelligence is not only about learning. So many people talk about machine learning, but machine learning is quite different from artificial intelligence. So, so my perspective for intelligence is, is that learning is only a very short-term uh, efforts uh, of plasticity for the brain. So what we have is also a development with decades, and also evolution with millions of years. So in this case, this is why we're creating different versions of the brain uh, for, for simulation, uh, starting from fly, fly brain, uh, such as Drosophila, and, and also for the mouse brain, and then monkey brain, and all the way down to uh, human brain. Um, so this is a kind of a transdisciplinary research. It's not only artificial intelligence. You have to understand a little bit about neuroscience, cognitive science, and also psychology, social psychology, complex system, develop, developmental biology, and also evolutionary biology. What's more importantly, uh, you should have in mind is anthropology and philosophy and ethics of, of AI. Otherwise, we might go to the wrong way. So we start by building synaptic level models of the neurons. We can build human neurons. They will, um, actually, the world is open, so you have human neuron data, spiking data. Um, 
on the web and also in the lab. So, and they are quite different. For example, you see that all the neurons that are, that, that are with different functions, they, 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 their spiking activities is really different. So, too much details, but you can see something like this. So this is a cortical column with, uh, with uh, 10,000 neurons working together uh, that we built. That was with 22 type of uh, different neurons in the, uh, in the cat visual cortex. When you see something like this as a real orientation selectivity task, so there are, uh, there are uh, neuron uh, uh, cortical columns like this which really functions pretty much in the same way in your brain. Um, but this is only a starting point because we have, we have many of these kind of cortical columns that really constitute the, the, neo, the neocortex. But what does it mean to artificial intelligence? Does it really useful to artificial intelligence? Because we are striving for artificial intelligence. I would like to share you one interesting story here. In the human brain, we have at least two types of uh, neurons. One is excitatory neurons, and the other is inhibitory neurons. So for traditional artificial neural network, we don't really have inhibitory neurons in it. Um, but we would like to introduce these kind of neurons into the model and see what happens. So when we introduce, there, so there are, so starting from 0%, when there are no uh, inhibitory neurons, and ending with, with actually 99% um, of the inhibitory neurons, what you see in here is that when you get the best pattern recognition performance of a task, 50% of the, uh, of the inhibitor neuron is essential. So what do we mean by that? You just get an optimal uh, mathematical um, model. So, so how it is related to human cognition? Something interesting is that years ago, um, there, is a paper, uh, there is a paper on parallel and distributed computing, which is a state of the art uh, involved in our uh, field. Uh, the paper is by Francis Crick, one of the uh, pioneer in, in DNA. Uh, so they say that for the visual cortex, actually exactly we have 15% of the inhibitor neurons. So this is in the mammalian brain. And also for um, somatosensor cortex in the brain, uh, it also contains 15% of the inhibitor neurons. I didn't really intro introduce this percentage into my model. It's that the model finds it's optimal by itself. So what do we mean really by that? Is that the mathematical optimization process is to some extent consistent with the biological revolution for millions of years. So in this case, what you see is that the model itself not only produced a better computational model for pattern recognition, but also to release, to, to actually help us to find the evolutionary properties that help the biological brain to shape itself, to better understand the world, and, and to better understand the, uh, the tasks that they are dealing with. So this is something that is amazing, uh, that triggers us to go a step forward. So this is the a simulation of, a, of the evil campus that, we, uh, uh, that we've been doing. This is related to human memory. So what is really interesting about this, we created a model of the evil campus which can do, mem uh, which can do me cognitive memory and also pattern recognition. So what's amazing here um, is that we, we compare with convolutional neural network, which is uh, and actually, an actual capsule network uh, last year. Uh, so what you find in here is really interesting is that when we introduce different percentage of the noise in here, you see that for convolutional neural network, let's say for 50% or 40% of the noise, you see that convolutional neural network is never working. Its accuracy is 30%. So this is a classification task of 10 classes. So in this case, it's pretty much 
uh, random. It also happens to capsule network. But my model, which is called the hippocampus inspired spiking neural network, actually uh, captures this kind of dynamic uh, robustness, which holds this accuracy um, above 85%. So, but I didn't really design the function to the model. Is that I simulated the hippocampus by spiking neural networks, and the the, the, the cognitive function and of noise robustness is really emerged from the structures and mechanisms that cause in the hippocampus. So it's so it's so, so it's not a mathematical optimization problem. I don't really have a function to deal with this this kind of cognitive task, it's emerged from the structures, connectums, and mechanisms back in the brain. Uh, many people talk about this, uh, Ben, the uh, previous speaker. Um, so this is the problem. When you change a pixel, and then deep neural network change their beliefs. So this is a horse when changing a pixel, it says it's an automobile. So think about the scenario in here. There is a robot police on the street, and there is a three-year-old boy holding a turtle. I change one pixel, and the robot police think that he is holding a gun. So what will happen later? So this is the problem for robustness in artificial intelligence. Many people say, wise sayings, like Charles Darwin and Herbert Spencer, that in what's, really, what's really that will survive in the environment is not the strongest nor the most intelligent, but the one that is really robust to the changing environment. So this should be the way that we go for the future of AI. This is why there will only be cockroaches after the singularity. <laughs> And this is and this and this is why we're actually going for the whole brain, uh, whole brain simulation. So right in here, what you see is a, a effort five years ago that we built the uh, the uh, point neuron uh, spike neural network of the of a, uh, of a rat brain uh, in here. So this is a mouse brain with uh, with uh, 71 million spike neurons. And also 200 and, <coughs> and 13 brain regions working together with the inhibitor and uh, excitatory neurons. And this is a rat brain. Um, you can really get the connectomics. Uh, at actually, so this is a micro scale, but we can go into a nano scale. And you see, when you stimulate, when you give stimulus to one of the regions in here. And you see how the signals is propagating to the whole uh, network of the brain. And so this is the basis for us to understand for future of, for the future mechanisms of, of the, on the nature of the intelligence. With that model, we can actually deploy this kind of model to real world applications and, and see how it behaves. So for example, you, you have this kind of story. Uh, so for beating computer games to for, for help the UAVs to 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 avoid obstacles, and this is a, a now robot with a uh, with a simulated brain, but a rough brain uh, that interact with my colleague to learn the human gestures. What do we mean by go away, and what do we mean by come up? But something different compared to uh, deep um, convolution of uh, deep. Uh, reinforcing learning here is that we have a multiple brain region coordination model that we can really understand the, the computational perspective of each of the regions and how it functions when you when you have this kind of very different kind of challenge to them. So, for example, in the mammalian brain, we have a brain region called STN, which help you to make decisions, but not fast decisions. It says, "Wait a minute." So this does not really exist in the fly brain. So this comes from evolution. So we deploy them to real UAVs so that it can um, 
it can pass the door or, or window by itself to well, there are no rules for, for them. They got the rules online uh, for interacting with the world. I might talk to you a, uh, another example about evolution. What, what do we get from the uh, biological revolu evolution is that, uh, for example, visual fit. We, uh, in a normal brain that we have, we, we're not really having one visual system. Visual system one is this. This one helps you to do pattern recognition, and this one helps you to do tracking. But there's another one, uh, which is from retina, very, uh, very, very quickly sending signals to amygdala and to trigger your uh, emergent behaviors like visual fail. This comes from evolution. It's not really, it's not really a trained model of the, uh, it's not really a short-term trained uh, model of the brain. You, you're not really learning how to do visual fear, how to, how, how to drink, how to drink milk, or how the, or how the, uh, uh, how the duck uh, really uh, survive in the in the water. No, they don't really, they don't really learn that. They, they were born with that. That was from, that was from evolution. So we build this kind of evolutionary computational principles to the model so that the UAVs can do emergent uh, visual shared uh, avoidance uh, so that it cannot be really uh, destroyed uh, by sudden uh, attack. This is only a, a split of some of the efforts uh, of, uh, of the efforts that we have. What we are really striving for is a comprehensive model of the brain uh, of the brain so that uh, it can really behave uh, with various kind of cognitive functions and to and to solve the problems that we didn't really solve, uh, see. So in this case, starting from the multi-sensor inputs uh, with learning and memory, different kind of learning mechanisms, uh, with this kind of components, what's really important in here is that the building block is with spike neurons. There are no rules in here, no artificial uh, uh, six more neurons in here, uh, but with biological inside uh, neurons. We hope them to, to actually challenge very different tasks uh, by, by robots so that it can rearrange my thoughts and also to, to clean the, the table or to wipe the blackboard. Very different tasks, but with similar components that, that can be self-organized into a holistic system to, to actually help us to to make this happen. I think there, there's only, we are actually in a very starting point to understand the nature of artificial intelligence. So what do we mean really by intelligence? When you read a cognitive psychology book, you will find more than a hundred cognitive functions on that. So in this case, how many have we been challenging in, in the field of artificial intelligence? I think it might be 10. So, so I would say that there are plenty of space for for the research in here, but I only have time to talk about the most essential ones. Uh, so my topic is a, a little bit about consciousness. So I'm gonna go into the self part. From my point of view, I think intelligence and self cannot be really split. Uh, from my point of view, you. You cannot really say whether an artificial intelligence can be with self. My question is, how can it be intelligent if it is without self? So uh, this is the elementary question, can machine think? We also have this guy, a philosopher, saying, I think, therefore I am. But you cannot say, you think, therefore you are, because you are in my perceptual bubble. In this case, can we ask? Can a machine be with intelligence? Or can a machine be conscious? They are in my perceptual bubble. So in this case, only that they are with the, the, the concept of self, a model of self, can they really produce intelligent behaviors and with the, the, the real mechanisms of, of consciousness. So talking about self-consciousness, if people believe that only these kind of animals are with self-consciousness because they can pass the mirror test. 
So we start with the monkey brain. We build a, a, a spiky neural model of the monkey brain uh, with 383 uh, brain regions coordinating uh, with each other. Uh, for your information, monkey brains, it's different from the human brain, uh, but from the brain region level, they are pretty much uh, like to each other, but not to the neuron level. This is very interesting. For, for neuron level, uh, monkeys are very relevant to a rat. Surprising, huh? Uh, so this is the, the spiking version of the brain. So what do I do for that? There is a colleague from Shanghai uh, in my uh, center of excellence in Chinese Academy of Science. They train racist monkey for the mirror test. So the world believes that racist monkey is, is without self-consciousness because they cannot really pass the mirror test. Uh, they, they, they don't really recognize themselves in the mirror. Uh, but that was the previous study. So within two to five weeks of training, the, the monkey managed to recognize themselves in, uh, in the mirror and also in two others. So my challenge in here is that once we have a model, a rough model of the monkey brain, still rough in here, and then we, we use the same experiment to challenge the robot. So I, I don't see any difficulties whether a robot, whether a group of robots can cannot really pass the mirror test. So I did it with the simulated monkey brain that I have. So those neuroscience scientists says that, oh no, it's just the fake news, you know? So you, you, you're using some tricks in here. It's not a real brain. So what I said is that, wait a minute in here. So I used, I used a multiple brain region coordination model, which is pretty much uh, based on the monkey brain. I used the experiment that you designed, and the robot has the task you say that it is without self-consciousness. And the monkey has that, and you say that it is without, it, it is with self-consciousness. So what I suggest is that both of, is, is that the experiment itself have problems. It's not the monkey or the, the robot. It is, the problem is that the mirror test cannot be a golden standard for self-consciousness test. Otherwise, you have to you have to agree uh, that this this one is with. But to my understanding, even myself doesn't really believe that my robot now is with self-consciousness. So this is a fundamental challenge, I guess, from artificial intelligence to the fundamental neuroscience research. So what do we do about it? How can we really have a self-conscious uh, robot? I I really divided them into 15 years of research. If I can really finish one of them, one by one, a year, I guess I would like to challenge this uh, this part uh, in 15 years. Now we are actually going to fear of mind and the cognitive empathy. We, we only build a cognitive brain, but it's not really a social brain. So uh, what's really amazing for the human brain is that you can infer what others is thinking. So this is my girl, uh, two year old, uh, holding a papa to see the book of papa. So what she claimed is that, okay, papa had, a, uh, had two eyes. So the story is about herself. So I, I guess she would like to see the, a book about herself. So she holds the papa see the book. So she, she made some inference in here about uh, the state about the state or the model of other uh, cognitive agents uh, in, in, in her mind. So this is kind of cognitive embassy uh, at the back. So what we do exactly uh, is to challenge the, the, the brain model with cognitive empathy for the false belief test. I, I don't really have time to do that. Uh, but just a uh, very interesting uh, starting point to share. At last, we go to the human brain uh, with 246 brain regions, spiking neurons. 
I would like to say this is a point neuron model of the human brain. So still very rough. We don't really have micro scale connector of the human brain. I think maybe we don't really have it within 10 years or 20 years. So this only are biologically realistic in the brain region level. Uh, but I think good enough to start something concrete. So you see that we're building fly brains, rodent brains, and also monkey brains, and also to the human brain. What we really want to ask ourselves is something like this. It's to relieving and exploring the origin of the intelligence and to discovering the, the evolution principles of the intelligence and to predict the evolutionary trends of intelligence. Um, so, this is, so this is not really a whole brain emulation. This is a brain inspired model with some of the biological uh, details. So the principles in here is to inspire by the biological revolution, but bridging the gaps that we don't really know from neuroscience, of uh, uh, using computational modeling uh, through uh, predictive um, learning. So, so this is my uh, vision to uh, extend it, uh, to, to extending and creating a conscious living beings. Here we have machines. And here we have humans. We are actually humanizing, humanizing the machine. And on the other hand, we are mechanizing human to create something which is called super intelligent conscious living beings. In the study of human brain, we are asking ourselves about who we are. And for the machine perspective, we are asking about the question who they are. Uh, but finally, we'll come up with the, the idea of the new we, of the new human machine, uh, harmonious society, that the, who the new we will be. So this, I think this is the, 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 the spirit and the vision for extended lives. So this is a new project that I started to, to, to create, uh, to, to create the, the efforts from these two perspectives. Um, I don't really have the time, uh, but the very first initial uh, idea and what you can see on the website is that now you can talk to those philosophers which has been passed and also for some good men and bad men. Uh, uh, even though you don't really have the chance to talk to him, uh, but we, 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 we still have some of the data that we receive spiking inputs now, uh, but uh, good enough to be a uh, starting point. I would like to summarize um, by some of the spirit that underlying my research on brains by artificial intelligence is that I think by brains by artificial intelligence, we are creating a conscious living beings that inspire, uh, that interact, that percept, interact, and change the world with the model uh, that are based on brain inspired structures, connect comics, and also mechanisms and operational principles. What's more important is the brain, the brain inspired the model will be more human than human. Well, so what do I mean by more human than human is that I think the human brain, the human is not really good enough. We, we need to transform ourselves into another state. For example, like, like this, we're not really friendly to intelligent as, as they, they are, and then we started to, to, to actually create uh, a nightmare to them. So, so what do we learn from that by, by of human? So there's another story about Hitchbolt. It travels uh, world, worldwide. This is to Canada, but this is to Florida. So it ends uh, with his life in, in Florida. Uh, but uh, the website of Hitchbolt says, my love for the human will never fade. So what do we mean? So what can we do to to them? So there is a wise saying from Confucius. Confucius say, "What you do not want others to do to you, do not do unto others." Likewise, from Jesus. So this is the movie that started my journey of artificial intelligence when I was a first year bachelor student. So there is a line saying that if a robot 
could genuinely love a person, what are the responsibilities of that person hold towards the mega in return? So this is a, I think, fundamental philosophical, philosophical problems to the human society that we, we are not only need AI principles that do constraints to robots, but to, uh, but to actually also to humans. So this is why I'm proposing how many uh, artificial intelligence principles, the philosophy for building, creating, uh, creative, uh, creating conscious living beings, principles not for AI, and all, but also principles for human to AI. So at last, those conscious living beings like humans and also the, the, the future versions, we are actually not really unique compared to them. Is that so? People think that uh, humans are unique. So, so Hawking says that we, we're not really unique. We're just normal uh, monkeys. Uh, but uh, Gazzaniga says that okay, at least we, we think about the meaning of life. But I think to the very future that the intelligent living beings will explore their own meaning of life. They will have their own interest, value, emotion, free will, belief, dream, and destiny. With all that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you.